I am happy to, uh, to welcome all of you to have a conversation uh, with Victoria Newland. Um, if you are here, you probably already know who Victoria Newland is, but for those five of you that are not aware of, of the awesomeness in which you are in front of, um, uh, Victoria is the CEO now of the Center for New American Security. How many months is that at this point? Uh, three. Three, there you go. Yeah. But who's uh, counting? Yeah. <laughs> um, she's also a senior advisor at the Boston Consulting Group and also shares with me was a Brookings Institution non-resident senior fellow. So this makes me feel good because it knows that at some point maybe I can reach your heights as well. Um, but more importantly, before that, uh, Victoria was a, a US diplomat for 32 years, uh, serving among other capacities as Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. Uh, she was the State Department spokesman from 2011 to 2013. Um, and she was U.S. Ambassador to NATO from 2005 to 2008. Uh, she was also, uh, for a time, the Principal Deputy uh, Foreign Policy Advisor to Vice President Dick Cheney uh, from 2003 to 2005. She served overseas in a variety of places, uh, including Russia, China, and Mongolia, um, and is fortunately here to talk to us uh, about the current state of the relationship, I believe. Um, so uh, Victoria's going to speak for approximately 20 minutes um, because I'm sitting in the comfy chair, I get to ask uh, a few questions to start off with. But mostly, this is going to be an opportunity for you uh, to ask questions. I believe, yes, we have uh, at least one mic set up over there. If you could, when you do have a question, I think we ask that you go to the microphone. Will we have one there as well? We'll have two mics set up uh, once the questions start. We'll ask you to please line up behind the microphones because uh, we are also recording this, and so that way we can have a good recording. Uh, with that, please join me in welcoming Victoria Newland. Am I using this or am I using? Uh, whichever one you want to. OK. Hello, Fletcher. Thank you very much, Dan. That was very kind. I am delighted to be here. I was last here with Secretary Kerry in the summer of 16 when he brought all his European allied boyfriends and girlfriends here. And we tried to make peace in Syria. You know how that worked out. But we had a great time in Boston, and we're out on the river. Uh, I'm delighted to be here not only in Dan's company, but in the company of the fabulous uh, Chris Miller. Congratulations to Fletcher for getting one of the hottest young minds in Soviet and Russian affairs to the school. Uh, full disclosure, Chris and I taught together at Yale last year, and he became a great friend. And also, uh, a friend is your dean. Uh, Admiral Stavridis, better known to those of us in the NATO world as the Supreme, once a Supreme Allied Commander, always a Supreme. So I'm delighted to be here. When Dan says that I was a diplomat for 32 years, I just want you to put this in perspective. Obviously, I started when I was 10, right? Um, otherwise, how could this be possible? Anyway, um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the arc of uh, U.S.-Russian relations, and we're going to speed date through about 30 years um, from the time of late Gorbachev uh, to the present and talk a little bit about uh, how we saw each other through this period and um, some of the dashed hopes that we had for the relationship. Let's put it that way. Uh, I would describe this period in three different categories. The first I would call uh, the field of dreams, late Gorbachev, um, through Yeltsin, even into early Putin. And on our side, that's Reagan, H.W. Bush, the Clinton administration, and the beginning of Bush 43. Phase two is what I call the Porcupine Partnership, which you can trace from about 2003 uh, to about uh, 2012, 2013. It's the second Putin term. It's Medvedev. It's the end of the Bush term and the beginning of the Obama term. And then, sadly, to where we are today, which I call the back to the future period, the return to geostrategy and ideological competition, which you can date to Putin's third term, Putin 3.0, up to the future. And I want to talk a little bit, uh, and then we can do more in the Q&A, about two great Lenin questions. Uh, what is to be done? And who is at fault? Who is, who is the guilty party? So first, the field of dreams. 
uh, and some of you friends in the audience, I see Bob there and others, uh, will recall better than current students who weren't born what an incredible moment it was in the late uh, Reagan-Gorbachev period as we began to see Gorbachev really start to open the Soviet Union. And you know, amazing things happening, the 18, uh, 1987 INF Treaty, Paris Troika and the opening of the, of the Soviet economy, the fall of the Berlin Wall, German reunification, which we did together. And then in July 91, uh, the Bush-Gorbachev summit and the signing of the, of the START Treaty. And we really thought at that time and continuing, we, at that time we thought that here was a guy who really could, through slow, modest reform, uh, change the Soviet Union into a less predatory country, a more open country, a reforming European state. Um, I was a baby foreign service officer at this time, serving on the Soviet desk, working with Bob Zelik on perestroika, trying to figure out how we could support this openness and push it forward, dying to go to Moscow. I finally got to Moscow in July of 1991 to work on the Russian Federation's politics inside the Soviet Union. And about six weeks after arriving, we woke up at six in the morning to cello music on the television, and nothing but cello, cello music. And if you recall, there had been a attempted coup against Gorbachev on August 19, 1991, by the head of the Defense Department, the head of the KGB, the head of all the security services, the head of the parliament, because Yeltsin was uh, Gorbachev was beginning to loosen the union and try to m create more of a confederated state with the constituent parts because the Russian Federation and other parts were trying to um, have more autonomy. The next thing I knew, I was called by my boss, dispatched over to the Russian parliament building, which was across the street from the embassy. Uh, but got there about 8 o'clock in the morning where Yeltsin was running a parliament meeting. Uh, stayed there all morning. My husband, who was having his first experience as a diplomatic spouse abroad, he was writing a book on the Nicaragua in Moscow at the time. Go figure. KGB didn't quite believe that either. But anyway, uh, he, was, <laughs> he was having lunch at the embassy cafeteria. And somebody said to him, where's your wife? And he said, she's doing her job. She's over at the Russian parliament. And they said to him, Did you, do you know that the Russian parliament is now surrounded by tanks? Uh, tanks from uh, we didn't know who. And also almost 200,000 Russian uh, citizens who had come out to support uh, the Gorbachev-Yeltsin side. Uh, so, um, and my husband rushed over to the Russian White House thinking, that, you know, this was two years after the Tiananmen massacre in China. He thought, you know, any minute the tanks will start firing, at least I'll be able to pull her out of the rubble. And instead, he, he was uh, present at that iconic moment where Yeltsin came out of the parliament building, stood on the tank, and stood in favor of change and democracy. Well, our own government wasn't so sure. Uh, uh, George W. Bush and Scowcroft took about 19 hours to decide whether the United States was going to be with the coup plotters or with Gorbachev. Ultimately, we did the right thing. But why would we not be sure? Because the question was, if Gorbachev couldn't hold this thing together, if Gorbachev couldn't hold the security services, might you have complete chaos, complete disarray, loose nukes, um, you know, refugees streaming all across Europe? Luckily for us, we did not make that decision. We supported, um, we supported Gorbachev, but neither the Russian people nor anybody else supported Gorbachev for very long. As you know, what happened later, by December of that year, the Soviet flag was coming down, the Soviet Union was disintegrated, and the Russian Federation was born. At this point, we really had great hopes that with um, the peaceful breakup, no nu loose nukes, no refugees, breakup of, of the Soviet Union, that Russia was on its way with our help and with a reforming Yeltsin to becoming a really modern, normal European state. Maybe, maybe France, a very large France that would sit with us, that would work with us on common problems, etc. And we made an enormous investment in that. 
Uh, the U.S. and its allies put almost $20 billion into helping Russia with economic reform, privatization, the voucher system. We were asked to help work on their new constitution, supporting a development of an NGO sector, private enterprise, all of those things. We welcomed Yeltsin into the G7, made it the G8. You remember all of those things. Uh, even when we had differences over the Bosnia war, we ultimately able, were able to negotiate a, a deal where, where Russia deployed with us in Bosnia. Bob was there for that and, and later uh, deployed with us in Kosovo, although that was a little bit more complicated. As we had countries around uh, in Central Europe petitioning to be part of NATO as we enlarge NATO, we also created a special structure with Russia where it would collaborate. Uh, with NATO, and it was a very, very hopeful time. Obviously, there were lots of problems. We can talk about these long or short. You know, there was a v various moves at revanche inside Russia. You'll remember that Rudskoy and Hasbolatov took over the Russian parliament, and Yeltsin ended up turning his own tanks on his own parliament in, in 1993. Not exactly uh, the move of a Democrat, but, but the way things were at that time. There was the Loans for Shares program, which um, sold off lots of Russian assets for uh, cash in 1996 that the, the Russian government really badly needed, but also created the oligarch culture that would come back uh, to haunt Russian reform and be exploited by, by Putin later. And there was extreme poverty for the vast majority of Russians and, an almost, um, and another crash almost in 1998. Uh, but nonetheless, we thought that with a lot of Western support, with, with strong knitting into the Western fabric, joining the Western clubs, bringing Russia into NATO operations like Bosnia and Kosovo, we would be able to have this positive trajectory. And that continues even when Putin takes over. Because remember, when Putin first comes to power, we're thinking of him as a St. Petersburg reformer. He was the hand-picked successor of Yeltsin. Um, and, you know, we thought perhaps uh, a guy who was uh, a little less enamored of the, uh, of the bottle, a little bit more stable, um, a little bit who had had some seasoning, he, he would be able to manage this great behemoth that was, that was Russia. And on, the, and on Putin's side, I think there was a great um, aspiration that he would be treated as a co-equal with uh, certainly... Um, uh, with uh, President uh, George W. Bush when he, when he came into office. And remember that after September 11th, 2001, the Russians were the first to offer assistance, the first to offer counterterrorism cooperation, and we were, we, we were doing very well. But this period was not very long-lasting. Um, it was not long-lasting for a number of reasons. It turned out that Putin was not Yeltsin. Uh, Putin, Putin was very much more uh, a man of Soviet experience, Soviet perception of what it takes to manage a country like Russia, order from the top down, um, and very much at best at that stage a transactional figure. Not a guy who wanted to think of Russia as the future France, but a guy who wanted to get back to that great power co-equal co status. And, you know, he saw in many of the moves that we were making, including the second round of NATO enlargement, uh, a, an opportunity to um, pose these things as a direct threat to Russian sovereignty. Even though NATO is a defensive alliance, we don't come for you if you're not coming for us. And we were still at this stage bending over backwards to try to keep Russia knitted in. So as we did the second round of enlargement, we also... Uh, created the NATO-Russia Council. The first effort to integrate Russia into NATO was very much a bilateral format. This was an effort the second time to have, have Russia sit between, I don't remember, Romania and Slovenia or Slovakia or something, like a real member of the club. And the idea was that most of the security discussion would migrate to that forum, that we'd only use the non-Russia piece for a few things. But it didn't work very well. And then by 2003, Putin is seeing the Western alliance crack over Iraq. He's seeing an opportunity to realign 
um, and create realignment with those countries that didn't support the Iraq war. Russia's also getting rich on the high oil prices. He's able to sock away lots of money in, for sovereign wealth. But at the same time, uh, through this period, 2002 to 2006, Putin is making very radical moves at home to roll back all of the much of the political economic opening of the Yeltsin years. Uh, and we are watching this, and the attitude of, of the Bush 43 administration was, as long as they are not making trouble outside their borders, what they do internally is a matter between Russia and its government. So at this stage, um, you had the rise of this Russian oligarchic um, set of businessmeni, was what they were called then. They're now called oligarchs. Uh, and with great wealth from the privatization came a desire among many of them for a say in the politics of Russia. So you had guys like Khodorkovsky, who had made mass amounts of money through Yukos, his, his oil company in Siberia, who now wanted to uh, have a say in how the parliament legislated um, taxes and tariffs and other regulatory aspects for Russian oil companies. And he was beginning to have influence on legislators. And Putin's thinking, not so much. Because once you start to share power, once you start to have consensual power with these business guys, who knows where it ends? And I won't be able to have my vertical of power. So the next thing you know, he is um, sending the tax authorities against Khodorkovsky. He's locking him up. And he's sending a chill through the rest of the oligarchic community. And remember that um, Berezovsky, another oligarch, had already fled to London because he refused to sell his businesses to the Russian state and was afraid. So over this period, the rest of the oligarchs uh, either flee, get dead, or begin to cooperate with the state in a way that creates this state capture environment. Um, 2003, 4, 5 is also when Putin clamps down on TV in Russia. Uh, print radio, uh, print, radio, et cetera, and the, the media space closes dramatically. Um, one of the, the most impactful moments in Putin's own evolution at this time is the Beslan hostage crisis, which you might remember. Uh, we'd already had one round of, of Chechen restiveness in the Yeltsin era, the first Chechen war. The second Chechen war was heating up big time. Um, one of the uh, radical Chechen leaders, a guy named Basayev, uh, holds a whole bunch of school children hostage in Beslan. By day three, Putin is quite desperate and doesn't know how to end it and decides to send in the tanks and the stormtroopers and you know, anywhere between 150 to 300 people die, including lots of school children. But Putin uses this internally um, to make the case that Russia itself could be on the brink of disintegration. And certainly, how could the Chechens alone mount such a threat to the Russian state? There must be external provocateurs involved with this. And this is also happening against the backdrop of the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, the Cedar Revolution in, in Lebanon. And, and he begins to get more and more paranoid that a colored revolution is coming his way as well. And by 2005, you have his now famous pronouncement that the Soviet Union's collapse was the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. And by 2007, he's coming to the Munich Security Conference, which is the uh, premier um, European gathering at the beginning of the, the, the second semester of the school year, if you will, in February, and saying and, and pronouncing, uh, A, that Russia um, needs, deserves, and will take good care of a sphere of influence, and it ought to be allowed to as the Soviet Union did, have, have um, a say in how its neighbors uh, behave, but also um, makes the case that we have in the West not been about integrating Russia, not been about supporting the development of, of, of a Russia that, is wor that he thinks is, is, is worthy of the name, but instead that we've been about containing and squeezing and uh, seeking to humiliate and marginalize Russia. And unless this sphere of influence is granted, 
um, that's the only proof that we really understand uh, how, to, how to deal with his country. And it really was quite a wake-up call for all of us. I'd like to say that it was um, the end of dreams. I think you know, there, was a, there was a long period, including through, um, well, why don't we say, so, so then you have uh, the Georgian War. I won't, I won't dwell on that or, or who, who started it and who ended it. But suffice to say, uh, by 2008, uh, you have uh, Russia um, lifting the, boycott, the, the traditional boycott on the restive separatist region of Georgia, Abkhazia, talking to the Abkhaz about potentially recognizing them as a state. You have Russian troops massing, and then uh, you end up with uh, Russian and Georgian forces facing off, and the potential that, that the Russian military could have taken over Georgia altogether. They didn't. Um, but really, it was um, a very dangerous moment. Now, I think I. I count the first Obama term and the Obama reset with Medvedev in 2009 as still part of the uh, phase of porcupine politic, porcupine uh, partnership, if you will. Um, and it's probably the high point of the porcupine partnership because when Medvedev comes in and, and Putin steps back from the presidency and becomes prime minister, um, you have in Medvedev a guy who has less Soviet history, who is actually interested in economics, who starts to talk again about reform of the economic system, uh, of uh, technological innovation. He starts an, uh, an anti-corruption campaign. And we again believe that if we can um, structure this partnership in a transactional way, that we can maybe have some win-wins with Medvedev. And it works for a little while. We have the signing of the New START Treaty, which cuts nuclear weapons at least in half between the two countries. The, the Russians open their airspace for US and allied forces to fly over to resupply in Afghanistan. We work together on Iran sanctions and DPRK sanctions. Um, Medvedev even proposes although the timing's a little unfortunate because it's right after the Georgian War, that we negotiate a brand new European security treaty that would encompass all the countries of the former Soviet Union and all the countries of NATO. We're a little skeptical of that, as you can imagine, because they've just rolled over and into one of their, their um, neighbors. So we don't take him up on that. But had we, maybe we could have at least started a conversation that might have blunted some of the things that come, that come later. But the real crack point is as Medvedev is opening the Russian system again, as reform is happening, um, understandably and predictably, some of the some in the in Russian society who are hearkening back to the great hope for a democratic Russia begin to also want more say in their own politics. Uh, so uh, in uh, December of 2011 after the Russian parliamentary elections that were broadly seen by international monitors and by many in Russia itself as not free and fair and as having a finger on the scale for Putin's party, the streets of Moscow erupt in what is later called uh, you know, the snow protests or the Bolotnaya protests. And these protests want a recount. They want a recalibration. And they go on into February. And here, Putin who is getting ready to come back to power, sees exactly his greatest nightmare, which is uh, a color revolution on the streets of his own country. And it's not possible that the Russian people wouldn't understand the necessity of order and the vertical of power. This must have been inspired from the outside. And he begins blaming us again. And that ushers in the period of extreme paranoia about future colored revolutions, uh, blaming of the United States for interference and its allies for interference in the Russian state, but also a period of restatizing and clamping down economically and politically on Russia itself. When Putin comes back for his third term, the Russian economy is only about, is, is about 60% in private hands. Uh, by the time he finishes his third term, it is 70% uh, state-owned again. 
Uh, he abolishes direct elections in most parts of, of Russia. He further cracks down on the press. And then in 2013, he notices that those countries around his periphery, especially the ones with the strongest aspiration to knit into the West, have been having this conversation with the European Union about associating with the EU. So Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia in 2003 are supposed to get from the EU if they complete the necessary reforms, 2013, sorry, 2013, uh, are supposed to get association. And what does that mean? It's going to mean a visa-free travel regime for the citizens of those countries to EU countries. And it's going to mean open free trade. So Putin wakes up to the fact that if this succeeds, it'll be the ultimate opportunity for these countries, short of membership in the EU, to truly begin to diversify their economies, to truly begin to look west rather than east. And instead of thinking about it in terms of a potential bridge itself between Russia and the EU through countries that had association, he sees it as a direct challenge. Um, and that takes you uh, to his decision to put extreme pressure on Yanukovych of Ukraine in particular uh, not, to, not to move forward with association. He offers a massive uh, bailout for the Ukrainian economy in November 2013, uh, which the Ukrainians really need because uh, the Yanukovych and his cronies had been ripping off the state for a long time. The books didn't balance. Uh, the economy wasn't stable. And they had failed, despite our best efforts to help them, to come up with a deal with the IMF, which might have put an undercarriage under their economy before they moved to association with the EU, might have given them more opportunity. But that would have required that the thieving end, um, and that wasn't going to work. And so Putin offers a massive loan. Yanukovych takes it, and you know the rest. The streets of, of Kiev and other cities across Ukraine explode with protest. You have the Maidan protests. Uh, which lead eventually um, to efforts to negotiate with Yanukovych, some of which I was personally involved with. We can talk about um, uh, some of the more colorful chapters of my <laughs> diplomatic history in the Q&A if you'd like. But ultimately, a deal with Yanukovych that he will share power with the opposition. First that we tried to midwife, then that the Europeans midwife, but then Yanukovych flees on the deal. Um, he's impeached by his own parliament. The Russians claim that, that he was... Um, overthrown. This is actually not accurate, but we can talk about that too. And then the Russian reaction is to jump into Crimea, pulling, uh, pulling out plans that they'd had on the shelf for a number of years, and then starts little green men into eastern Ukraine, Donbass. And um, by this time, it is uh, full-on information operations of the kind that we would later see in the United States in, and parts of Europe. Uh, information operations in, that they had used on their own people in Ukraine, across Central Europe, an acceleration of efforts to um, buy, control, uh, manage politics. And then in 2015, um, the jump into Syria, where uh, at first uh, Russia claims that it is going to move into Syria to help the US and others help defeat ISIS. But we all know what happens then. Um, Russia deploys combat forces to support the Assad regime more in stabilizing Assad's regime than in, in, in fighting ISIS. And at this point, um, you now have a full-on assertion of Russian, uh, Russian power, Russian influence, Russian military coercion, Russian information operations, not just in Ukraine, but in parts of, of um, but with around the Syria operation, et cetera, and a major campaign inside Russia, on the one hand, to talk about the necessity of these things, because Russia is surrounded by external enemies. On the other hand, to spur national, nationalism pride, to represent Russia as great again, uh, not only as protecting the periphery, but also as coming back in the Middle East, being an arbiter 
of uh, the international balance of power. But a lot of this is also about diverting attention from the fact that there is nothing much good going on at home. Um, there is, by 2000 and the period between 2014 and 2017 is a, a very difficult time for the Russian economy. The um, high oil prices that had uh, floated Putin and Putinism uh, and floated an improvement in the quality of life under Putin for most Ru Russians uh, have flattened out, oil bo bottoms out. And then, of course, in response to the uh, invasions in Ukraine uh, and, and later um, having to do with uh, other, other difficulties with Russia, the West has employed led by the US has imposed a series of escalating economic sanctions, which are beginning to bite on the Russian economy. And the lack of reform is beginning to, to bite as well. Uh, as, and along with the expenses of all these foreign adventures, the, advent, the expenses of Ukraine, the expenses of, of Syria. And Russia has, by this time, run through uh, the reserve fund that it had built up with oil money of $142 billion and has also run through half of the National Sovereign Wealth Fund. So uh, a, a Putin who is not delivering for his people at home needs bread and circuses abroad um, to keep people diverted from that. Um, and by, by 2017, uh, when Russians are asked what they worry, and it works for a while, it works for a long while, you know, in, in, in great pride about, how, about Crimea, Nash, our Crimea, a lot of um, uh, national support at the beginning for Syria until some of the boys start coming home in coffins and, and it starts to get expensive and it's not really clear how you get out. Uh, but by 2017, when Putin's again running for, for re-election in early 2018, when Levada, one of the best remaining polling operations in Russia, asks, asks Russian citizens what they care most about, um, they are not talking about Ukraine or Syria or how to make Russia great again out there. They're talking about the fact that their hospitals need help, that corruption is on an all-time high. Um, and you know, that is not a great or stable place to be. And that takes you to uh, the Russian economy that we see today. Although Russia will, according to the IMF and the World Bank, likely grow again this year, after four years of re recession, it'll grow at about 1.7. It's not growing at the rate of the rest of the world, which is now growing at a 3 or 4% rate, depending upon where you are. Um, it's uh, real household incomes are continuing to decline in Russia for the fourth year in a row. The poverty rate, which was in 2013 11%, is now up around 14%. And the systemic decades now of low infrastructure investment, lack of automation, aging workforce, corruption, and economic bloat are beginning to create a very br uh, brittle internal situation. So, Putin, of course, uh, having invested heavily in the 2016 US election and in other elections around the alliance, and we can talk about that as much or as little as you want in the Q&A, he's hoping for a little relief from the external pressure when President Trump is sworn in. He's used to getting a reset when you get a new US president. Every new US president tries again. Um, he, uh, pre uh, candidate Trump, had been very positive about getting along with Russia in, uh, during the campaign. Uh, but very quickly, uh, the Kremlin is first disappointed and then downright hostile when it sees what actually happens in the United States. So the first thing that happens, as you know, is one of the first pieces of legislation passed by both houses of Congress and overwhelming majorities in 2017 is a uh, legislation of the sanctions on Russia that before that had been 
purely in executive order. They were not a, a, f a function of US law. The president at first doesn't want to sign them, and then he doesn't want to implement them, but he ultimately does both. And then um, we've seen this, uh, instead, of, instead of a coherent US policy towards Russia, whether it was a tough policy or whether it was a warm policy, the Russians have watched us vacillate back and forth with the US bureaucracy imposing ever steeper sanctions, the response, obviously, that we've recently had of, of, of kicking out lots of diplomats uh, in response to the, the poisoning in, uh, in the UK, at the same time that the president himself wants to engage, um, but, but just three days ago blamed Russia for uh, its responsibility in Syria for the use of chemical weapons. So if there's anything that uh, Soviets first and Russians second hate more in U.S. policy than a tough U.S. policy, it's an unpredictable U.S. policy. Uh, so they are asking themselves, Stodielitz, what is to be done. We are asking ourselves, Stodielitz, what is to be done. Um, we can go as long or as short on this as you want in the Q&A, but I do think that having unfortunately come back to the future, uh, we need to now take some lessons from uh, the time when uh, we had a highly transactional um, relationship with Moscow, and those lessons include the following. We can't deal with Russian uh, US issues in discrete families and tactically. Can't deal with Ukraine over here and Syria over there and democracy undercutting over there. And it has, there has to be a comprehensive approach to this. And it's particularly important with a guy like Putin who maybe uh, began as a transactional player and is now a very uh, strictly zero-sum player. If it's good for us, it must be bad for them and the other way around. Um, and, and that the US has to lead in this um, is the second lesson. The third lesson is we've got to have allied unity. Um, we can't, as we have over the last two years, last year and a half in particular, um, allow a, a picking off of the alliance and cutting of separate, of separate deals. Um, and third, that, and fourth, I guess this is now, um, there has to be a mix of pressure and opportunity in the conversation that we're offering to Moscow. And by that, I mean on the pressure side, um, we have to be prepared as a community of free nations to work together to deter, to contain, to expose, to defeat any actions by Moscow that threaten our security, that threaten our democracy, and threaten our prosperity. And we have to be intentional and clear about our plan to do that. But at the same time, we have to offer incentives for Putin, and maybe even more importantly, for those around him who benefit from Putinism as long as it lasts, um, we have to offer them incentives for de-escalating, for cooperating where we can, for coming back to at least a transactional approach, if not a cooperative approach, where possibly we can do things together. And we have to encourage them where possible to pay more attention to how brittle and dried their own garden is at home, and to put their prodigious energy and patriotism into building a stronger Russia and having fewer adventures out here in the free world. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Victoria, for uh, that wonderful tour of uh, my 20s. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I misspent youth as well. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Uh, recalling um, uh, times when we thought things were going to be different. Um, let me start off by asking you uh, a question about uh, sort of the history that you said. L let me play the, the, the Russian version of Devil's Advocate here, yeah. which is, so 
you gave this sort of uh, of history of how the bilateral relationship. I'm pretty sure that the Russians would come back and say that there were two important things that you elided that affects the way in which at least two, but but let, let's focus on two that they would think would be important aspect, particularly during the Putin phase in terms of defining the relationship. The first would be the 2002 withdrawal from the ABM Treaty, mm -hmm. which was done right after, as you say, Vladimir Putin really did extend yes. you know, a, a hand after 9-11. And this is, you know, in some ways, the, the signal that Putin got from this was, we can do this too, potentially down the road, if we so choose. And indeed, you set the, uh, um, uh, set the template for this. The second um, is the 2008 conference in uh, the NATO conference in Bucharest, um, which as near as I can figure out, might be the greatest source of misperception between the mm. various players. But from the Russian side of things, that is always seen as the moment where some idea of NATO membership is extended to Ukraine and Georgia. Um, and coincidentally, those are the countries that wind up getting, you know, getting invaded down the road. But that might have been the moment where whatever hope that Putin had that he could have a at least transactional relationship with the West. And it's worth remembering, he did make various efforts at various points to suggest, as you say, that he wanted a stronger partnership. He wanted a common European home from Lisbon to Vladivostok and what have you. So to what extent does the US do, you know, play some, have some culpability in terms of Putin's turn away from the West? Well, obviously there, there are mistakes made on, on all sides. I won't say that we made no mistakes of our own and, and particularly in the context of ABM, you know, we've, we've seen successive presidents come in and undo or rip up very quickly things that their pre pre predecessors have done with relatively little consultation. Um, whether we could have managed the tearing up of the ABM treaty uh, better, I'm not sure, uh, but we certainly didn't try. But it, in terms of the continuing conversations that we had about arms control and our ability thereafter to cut new deals uh, when we worked hard at it. Um, you know, even though it was, it was shocking to, to Russian elites, it didn't necessarily mean much to the Russian people. And I think the, the way Putin reacted to it was expedient within his growing narrative of grievance rather than a real immediate threat to him. Um, you know, similarly, uh, you know, you can, you can argue it round or flat with regard to the Bucharest summit where in 2008 we had Ukraine and Georgia knocking aggressively on NATO's door. They had been for almost a decade partners of NATO, Georgia in particular, but both of them had deployed with us in Afghanistan. Had, Georgia had also deployed with us in Iraq. They had made significant reforms not sufficient uh, from NATO's perspective at that time or even now to qualify for membership. Uh, what they wanted was the junior varsity. They wanted the membership action program, which is the program NATO puts countries into when they're training for membership. Even that was considered too provocative by NATO leaders in 2008. But we didn't want to give them nothing. We wanted to give them a signal that they were still on course. And so this, um, strange bit of language was concocted. I remember the national security advisors of various NATO countries, including Steve Hadley, while the NATO meeting is going on, they're disappearing behind a curtain to kind of try to work out the last of the language. Bob probably remembers that too. Um, so what NATO says in 2008 is that, and, and is that, uh, they will become members, so it's an aspirational thing that we expect we will bring them in, but there's no clear path and there's no clear timetable. Now, remember at this point that in, in February and March, there had already been an increasing set, uh, round of tension between Russia and Georgia, which we can go back over. Russia was essentially beginning to mass troops around Georgia. Georgia was getting ready to fall into traps that were being set for it. Um, so there was also a sense that if we didn't give any kind of signal, it could be a green light that, that NATO didn't care about Georgia in particular and go ahead and have at it and eat it up. Uh, but then there were other allies who thought that if we were more forward leaning than what we did, um, then in fact we would provoke Russia as well. So we tried to ch chart this middle course and we ended up with a Georgian-Russian war anyway. Um. I want to turn the question in some ways to less about Russia and now about essentially 
U.S. domestic politics for Russian foreign policy after the 2016 election, which is to say, one of the things it would strike me that one of the after effects, the last, more lasting legacies of the 2016 election and the allegations of Russian interference is that previously Democrats had been somewhat more pop, you know, optimistic about the idea of pursuing a partnership with, uh, with Russia. You know, Clinton did this, Bush admittedly did some of it, but, but Obama was, was clearly much bigger on the reset. And you can argue that one of the effects of, of what happened in 2016 is that now Democrats have found a country that they can be hawkish on in terms of foreign policy, um, in, in no small part because of the allegations of interference. So I, I guess assuming, asking you in some ways to picture a post-Trump universe, um, you know, is there going to be any president on either side of the political aisle that will be willing to invest in a relationship with Russia that is anything but hawkish? over the next decade or so? Well, I don't know what you define as, as hawkish or soft or, you know, my, the first president I worked for was Ronald Reagan, who starts off really hawkish and, and ends up, you know, bear-hugging Gorbachev. Mm -hmm. um, and when Gorbachev comes and makes his first visit after Reagan's out of office, he nonetheless goes to California to, to collect on the hug. So I think, you know, uh, both parties have tried it both ways, and it often depends on... Uh, you know, whether we're in the field of dreams or whether we're in a transactional place or whether we are back to the future and, and politics on both sides affect. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to stare into a, into a crystal ball. I, I do think that uh, regardless of party, um, it should not be about emotion. It should be about uh, U.S. and allied interest, and as I said, it should be about deterring the worst and encouraging the best, and particularly being unified in ensuring that um, as, as if and when Russia tries to damage our democracy or our prosperity or our security, that we are unified in standing up to it, but, but nonetheless offering a better future, and perhaps a better future than, than Putin thinks is possible, and challenging him and his Apparat and the Russian people to decide: Do they want to continue on this course that might have felt glorious, you know, three years ago, and and now threatens to leave them behind as the world gets um, out of recession and, and back to growth? So you can argue that the the West has been somewhat challenged in terms of of trying to uh, coordinate among allies, particularly over the last fourteen months. But potentially the most successful example recently was the expulsion, the sort of coordinated expulsion of diplomats in response to the attack uh, in Salisbury, which, which really did seem to be a sort of a gross violation of, of norms. And I guess my question is, do you think that that kind of coordinated response will actually not cause not cause Russia to completely scale back, but, but did it represent a line where Putin now, or the, the Russian state now recognizes there will actually be serious consequences if they violate these kinds of diplomatic norms? You know, I like the old um, Leninist maxim for uh, describing Putin's operating style these days. Uh, and it goes like this, Lenin said, is, is, uh, is um, uh, quoted as saying, uh, in dealing with external relations, thrust in the bayonet. When you hit bone, stop. If you hit mush, push. So I think you know, the, question, the question is whether we present uh, bone or whether we present mush and whether we are consistent in saying you're not going to be poisoning our citizens on our streets or even folks who used to be your citizens and are now our citizens or poisoning Syrians and Syrian children on their right. streets. Uh, one last question before I uh, open it up to the audience, which is, I believe Putin, after his you know, really surprised re-election victory, um, I mean, it was, it was tuck and go, it was uh, nip and tuck there for a while. You mean the selection? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, I believe in his speech, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, just abuse me of this notion, basically suggested that what he wanted to do in his second term was focus far more on the domestic situation than the notion of, you know, of making Russia a great power again. I guess my question is, if you do see Putin pivot inwards, as it were, and focus on the very economic, you know, serious economic problems that you identified, um, which, by the way, his foreign policy has made worse for a whole variety of yes. reasons, you know, despite the sort of toxic environment right now, or the, the, you know, the back to the future state right now, 
Do you think that presents an opportunity for the West to somehow try to, to you know, nudge the relationship in a slightly more productive, if I'll be a transactional uh, p direction? And there's nothing wrong with transactional foreign policy right. as long as it's achieving value for, for both sides, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to hope so, but it re will require Putin making a choice to invest in his own country and his own people instead of foreign adventures, to be willing to have a settlement in Ukraine that uh, results in the, in the withdrawal of Russian forces from, from Donbass at least, and conversation about about uh, about Crimea that uh, results in working together uh, to create a stable democratic Syria that can govern itself without terror and ideally without Assad. Um, so these are and and having him stand down on these efforts to undermine our democratic conversations inside our own countries, um, you know, so that we don't have to take more aggressive actions, not to mention the arms control problems that we have, including violations of the INF Treaty. So, you know, there is a, there is a, a, a conversation to be had around um, gradual lifting of sanctions and, and getting back to economic uh, business investment opportunity for Russia if Russia will tend its own garden rather than making uh, sowing mayhem out here in the world. Okay, I lied. I have one more follow-up question uh, based on... Is he going to ever let you guys talk? I am going to let you guys talk, but, but in some ways, you know, one of the things that, that characterized the Cold War diplomatic relationship between the two, mm -hmm. the two countries was the idea of track two diplomacy. Yep. And so I bring this up because I'm at the Fletcher School and, and mm -hmm. many of my students are, are enthusiasts. Track two like lizards. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, do you think, given the sort of frozen state of, of the bilateral relationship officially, there is an opportunity for track two or track 1.5 to at least make some degree of headway between Russia and the United States? You know, um, it was a really rich environment even in the 80s, the, the track two business. I remember meeting with lots of folks working on things. And, and obviously through the 90s and, and when Russia had a relatively fertile think tank culture um, when we were children. <laughs> when you we were, were, you were we two, were starting, I was ten. We were starting was out, exactly, exactly. Um, I think one of, one of the hallmarks of, of uh, Putin's increasing vertical of power and clampdown inside Russia is that he's also closed space for uh, serious intellectual and foreign policy conversations. So when you're trying to negotiate some, you know, when I, when I was coming up, once, once the leader said, let's try to make a deal, then there would be a whole Russian team fielded and we would try to get creative and see if we could collectively find some common interest, whether it was on an arms control deal or whether it was working on, you know, third country issues. Um, now, Putin will let almost nobody speak for him. Uh, when I was working uh, on the Ukraine issues, I had seven rounds of negotiations with Putin's guy in, in, in 2016. Um, he was the only one. The foreign ministry was cut out. Um, the Russian military was really scared to talk. He was the only guy, because he had an office down the hall from Putin, who was really allowed to engage in any kind of a creative way. And, and you know, ultimately, we couldn't get there for a whole bunch of reasons. So it's, it's very difficult. And now, in terms of track two, you know, with, with the, the, uh, the decision to not allow, to cut off our high school exchange program, to not support in the way that they used to a lot of the university exchange, uh, to have questions about NGO to NGO, uh, collaboration and to declare half of the NGOs that we work with, if not more, in Russia as you know agents of foreign influence, uh, including ones that we don't necessarily um, have uh, a financially supportive relationship with. It's it's just very difficult. There ain't nobody to track to with who's got any power to change the system. Well, this does make me further grateful that our students were able to go to Russia uh, last month as uh, part of uh, the Russian Eurasia program. Uh, and that's very important, you know. Um, 
when I was coming up, it was really cool to be, you know, a Russian, to do Russian language, to do Soviet stuff, to do arms control. And then we kind of fell out of favor after September 11th. It was all about uh, learning, learning Arabic and uh, doing, doing the Middle East. Well, guess what? We're back. <laughs> and the, pro the problems are not getting easier. So study hard. And we need more investment in the U.S. in folks who speak Russian and understand this part of the world. And on that note, I now invite uh, members of the audience to please uh, ask questions of Victoria. Uh, there are mics there, and you can line up there and behind. And please identify yourself when you ask uh, your question. Also, just for the kicks, make it an actual question rather than a comment. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Russell Hathaway. I'm a student at the Fletcher School uh, MAUD program. Thank you so much for coming. Um, there's I often see a lot of interest in U.S. media and elsewhere in Russian domestic opposition groups to Putin. I wanted to ask if there's, if any of these opposition groups um, within Russia, political opposition groups, um, are perceived as a as a threat by by Putin, and whether it makes, whether we have really any ability to tell what threat or not they pose, and if these groups, if the opposition leaders, their sentiments would differ meaningfully in their outward orientation toward the U.S. from Vladimir Putin, if they were to gain any traction? Uh, well, it's relatively hard to know these days because uh, the Kremlin and Putin are sufficiently concerned about them that they don't let real candidates run. Uh, witness you know, the most recent round with Navalny, who has the broadest-based movement now in terms of interest and and you know whether Navalny would be more uh, open more pro western it's hard to know but he's certainly focused on the internal problems of Russia including the very high rate of corruption and you know he's got this fantastic gotcha show um, which I was um, privileged to have a little cameo in not too long ago um, they got most of it wrong, but it was kind of fun. Um, but but he you know he has traction because he's talking about the problems that that individual Russians care about. But you know there's there's something going on if if it's considered too threatening to let him really run. Thank you. Um, my name is Tung Hyun Kim, second year MAL student at the Fletcher School. What is we, MAL, please? Uh, oh, Master of Arts. Our Master's of Arts in Law and Diplomacy. All right, it's, all right. it's a two years right. Master's program. Yeah. I'm originally from South Korea, and I was lucky to partake in Russia, Russia Spring Break Russia Trek. And one of the um, echoing questions that echoed us throughout the trip was the confidence-building measure between Russia and the United States, United States and Russia. Uh, particularly, my team worked on cyber um, security, information security, uh, specific agendas where um, cyber uh, critical U.S. critical infrastructures and cyber nuclear entanglement. And we proposed to the Russian MFA and, and U.S. Embassy in Moscow on the confidence building measures. And all of the all of the responses were, this is great. There are confidence building measures, but the problem is there is no confidence between two countries. So that bugged me really um, hard after, even after coming back to even after coming back. <clears throat> so based on your experiences, uh, there are frameworks for the confidence building measure between the two countries. But if it's not working, what should we do more? I mean, it's, it's really circumstance dependent. What you want to do is try to find those areas where you can create common interest and where you can have some win-wins. I'd be interested in what you proposed that the embassy liked but didn't think they could implement. Can you tell me a little more about that? Sure. So for example, we proposed a uh, information exchange on the cyber incidents on the critical infrastructure on the US and Russia. And, um, and Russian propositions were that there, even though there are uh, frameworks to exchange information on cyber incidents on U.S. critical infrastructure, U.S. never ask, uh, U.S. never officially use a channel and just blame the Russian government through the, through the liberal media. So they were pretty much unhappy with uh, American counterpart not using the agreed frameworks, uh, so to speak. Uh, so this goes to lack of trust, as you said, lack of confidence. Uh, those channels were set up, my, my memory is that they were mid-Obama administration to try to talk about cyber norms in particular. And there was some question about whether the US and Russia might have the same kinds of problems with an emerging China, in fact, um, and that we might be able to work on these things. But as with many of these dialogues that we've tried um, at different times during the period that we covered in this conversation, uh, 
at least from the US perspective, we felt that we would come to the channel and give concrete examples of things that we wanted to work on, and the Russians would use the channel not to be explicit about their internal problems or things that they were learning about third countries, but rather just to beat us about perceived uh, misdeeds inside Russia. So we, we never got to that area of common, of common interest. So of course the Russians want to use the official channels because um, they're very active in the unofficial channels and don't want to talk about that. Hi, Ambassador Newland. My name is Kai. I'm an undergrad at Tufts University. Firstly, thank you for coming uh, here today. Um, my question is about Putin's um, sphere of advisors. Um, I think there's been quite a fixation on Putin as an individual, particularly sort of in the media yes. as of late, um, and not to downplay at all the role that Putin himself has in deciding Russian policy, but there must be, um, and we know that there is sort of um, a, a sphere of influence, so to speak, of Putin's advisors, um, his ministers, his friends in the private sector, um, his friends who are running the SOEs, um, in your own diplomatic experience, how did you witness, did you witness and how um, when these advisors and the sort of sphere of influence would actually influence policy and how do you think that is playing out actively today? Thank you. Uh, so the theory behind uh, some of the sanctions that we enacted in response to Crimea in the first instance, but particularly Donbass in Ukraine, was that if you could um, influence the economic interests of those close to Putin, those who had benefited from his form of rule, those who had this um, commingled financial relationship with the state, that they would put pressure on Putin to be more restrained. Um, in, in his actions. And so that takes you to some of the named sanctions we put on oligarchs and particularly those who are alleged to launder his money or money that is ill-gotten through contracts that he oversees. Um, and also goes to the issue of uh, their ability to get finance, banking finance, et cetera, in the international arena. And, you know, I think the success was, uh, was incomplete but not insignificant in the sense that when we first started imposing these sanctions in uh, late 14 or middle 14 after Malaysian Airlines is shot down, but then with a vengeance after the Russian... Um, Ukrainian uh, opposition or Dom Donbass extremists push into Debaltseva uh, and effort to seize more territory. Uh, the forward motion and effort to grab more land uh, stopped and, and the line froze. So it could have been a lot worse. There was a time where we worried that uh, this offensive could push all the way to Kyiv um, in, in a way that would have been very hard to handle. So I think there was some effect. It's interesting that these sanctions that the Trump administration has just put on against oligarchs again go after more guys, some of the guys who come up in the Mueller investigation like Deripaska, uh, but also for the first time go, go towards the um, loopholes in the sanctions that some of Putin's friends found, like the Rottenbergs transferring money to their children, then you can now sanction the children, or um, we sanctioned for the first time the husband of one of Putin's daughters. So whether that'll have an effect, we'll see. Um, yep. Um, hi, my name is Cindy Garcia. I'm also a second year master's student here at Fletcher. Um, thank you, Ms. Newland, for being here. It's been a really um, interesting conversation and really happy to have you here at Fletcher. Thank you. Um, my question, um, well, let me start by saying that I had the pleasure recently of trying to explain Russia in a four-page paper while I was in Russia. It was a very difficult task. Um, but one of my conclusions... Did you take your laptop? I took a uh, old laptop of mine so I could type on, you know, at least in Word documents, efficiency. Smart women here at Fletcher. <laughs> 
Um, That's how they get in. So <laughs> after writing this paper, my conclusion was that the United States and Russia are currently lacking and have lacked a bilateral agreed upon vision for their strategic relationship going forward. And I feel like that's really essential for us going forward. So do you agree with this statement? And if so, can you comment on the feasibility of developing one within this presidency? Thank you. Just a small question. Um, <laughs> look, I think um, it's very hard to have a shared strategic vision if you don't have a shared orientation about the rules of the road within the international system. So that was what I was trying to highlight in the way I made the presentation, that you know, the, the, the question when first the Soviet Union and then Russia started opening was whether a post-Soviet Moscow would be interested in being knitted into the system that essentially we and our allies forged at the end of, of World War II and fitting in and benefiting from the prosperity and security that that could potentially um, provide. And you know, at the beginning, the answer was yes. And then in the middle, the answer was, well, only if we can go back to a system where we share co-equal ownership of it and, and we get a droit de regard over our neighborhood. And when that wasn't acceptable to us, it became, OK, we're not going to get to be rule setters, so how do we change the rules? And I think that's where we are now. And as long as uh, we're seeking different global governance and as long as they see uh, the system that we helped build and uphold as uh, uh, impinging on their ability to be great, it's going to be pretty hard. Thank you. Which isn't to say we shouldn't stop trying. <laughs> Thank you very much for being with us. I'm Sviad Zimbay from Georgia. How could Abkhazia. I tell you a Georgian? The eyebrows alone gave you away. <laughs> and the pocket square, I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was a compliment. <laughs> Um, I study security um, and indeed the region that uh, you have worked on, uh, NATO and your Atlantic security, Russia. Um, so my first question is uh, why uh, the United States, what was the factor that the United States didn't get to the Minsk agreement as one of the uh, major parties of the Minsk agreement? Was there the, the tension that the United States and you know better than me had with the European Union at the time? Um, and the second question is, um, when you ask NATO officials, uh, open door policy for NATO is there, um, and if countries carry out some reforms, they are eligible to become members. And when you also ask that if there is Russian factor, they say no other country has a right to decide. But when practical politics comes in, there is always question, oh, there is Russia. So, where's the truth? Uh -huh. um, on the NATO side, I want to believe in the spirit of the treaty and the spirit of what allies have said consistently, um, you know, since the founding, but certainly since the post-Cold War enlargements, which is the door to NATO remains open and Russia will not have a voice or a veto in those decisions. Um, you know, you obviously understand the, the complex neighborhood you live in. Uh, but I would also say um, that Georgia still has work to do on its own uh, democracy, on its own judicial system, on a, as much as we all value the partnership that we have with Georgia and the fact that we've been able to deploy together and the general pro-European trajectory. Um, so, so keep working hard. And um, I think in particular, Georgia can do even more uh, to... Um, strengthen itself, taking advantage of the fact that it now has visa-free travel to Europe and, and the open trade that was promised by, by, the, by the EU. Your second question, I can't remember now. About Ukraine and... It was about Minsk agreement, yeah. So the Minsk agreements were forged uh, between Russia, Ukraine, Germany, and France. Um, the United States started asking as early as 2015, wouldn't it be helpful to you all if we were a party to these negotiations? And you know, for a lot of reasons, including the desire for uh, Franco-German cooperation to solve Europe's, you know, to be European solving European problems, 
um, there was a sense that they should continue to try to lead this themselves, but they did ultimately welcome a parallel, mutually reinforcing process that the U.S. would lead, U.S., Ukraine, U.S., Russia, which is the set of negotiations that I was involved in. And, and by the time we got to 2016, the, the, they were, we were virtually enmeshed anyway, in the sense that we were uh, asking for the same things, we were trying to negotiate a, a deal with the, with the same parameters, and we were sort of trading rounds, you know, I or Kerry or the president would go out uh, and then the Europeans would go out and the other way around and we were sharing all of our information and asking the same things of Ukrainians and Russians. So, you know, it, did it work as efficiently as it might have? Um, no, but if we'd had more time to pursue it, uh, another presidential term, might it have worked? I think maybe. Good evening. Hello. Uh, thank you for being with us this evening. Uh, my name is Polina Belyakova. I'm a PhD student here, and I'm interested in internal conflicts and civil military relations. So being originally Ukrainian, I would like to combine like those two components in my question. There is a popular argument that, and as Professor Dresner mentioned today, that Russia actually starts this frozen conflicts in order to prevent potential uh, countries to join NATO. But there are also other aspects of being democratic, Western, and also fitting the NATO standards, like having democratic civil military relations, or transparency, accountability, and also some measurements of corruption. corruption. So my question to you is, in your point of view, how fighting a separatist insurgency in Eastern Ukraine actually affected the Ukrainian democracy? So is it now closer to the West not in spirit, but actually like on the ground, or the Ukrainian democracy actually is taking a great hit from being involved in this kind of conflict. You mean, did Russia succeed in hurting Ukraine's image in terms of its NATO and EU trajectory by the fact that they are sitting on pieces of Ukraine now? Is that what you mean? Not only the image, but actual democratic procedures and institutions. Yeah. So the way we would talk about this in the last administration that I served with Ukrainians was uh, let's work together on getting Russia out of Donbass and implementing the Minsk agreements. But your simultaneous and even more important job is to strengthen, democratize, and clean up corruption in the other 93% of Ukraine. Be the best 93% of Ukraine you possibly can be. And you know, present uh, to your partners in the West, but even more uh, to your neighbors, uh, the possibility of real post-Soviet transformation and liberation of the uh, power of people in a in a clean uh, representative governing structure with an open economy. So, how would you evaluate the situation for today? Is Ukraine succeeding in this fight fight for its own democratization or not? I think if you look at um, both legal progress, structural progress, the green shoots of society having a voice. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, this Maidan chapter has been far more successful than the last two times Ukraine tried to reform. Are you, uh, is Ukraine finished? Absolutely not. Is there a lot of hard work ahead? Absolutely. Are things a little bit paused and stalled as you start looking at your navel in, in time for the next round of presidential elections? I'm worried about that. I hope not. Um, I would hope that anybody in Ukraine who aspires to leadership in the next round, whether it's um, at Bankova or whether it's in the, in the, in the Rada, is focused on burnishing their, uh, their reform and particularly anti-corruption credentials rather than the opposite because there's no doubt that's what the mass of Ukrainian people want the most. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Uh, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Evgeny Zhuravel. I'm a PhD student, anthropology department, uh, Harvard University. Uh, can I ask you a question? Is you came danger? all the way across town for this from that other place? Yes. All right. <laughs> 
Uh, can I ask a question? Is there a danger that uh, further alienation of uh, Russia from the West will uh, foster some kind of alliance, uh, military, economic, political between uh, uh, Russia and China, which uh, last time when it happened, it was a huge inconvenience for the United States? You know, obviously Russia and China have their own complexes in their relationship with each other, um, including a lot of institutional racism on both sides in the way they look at each other. Uh, I'm, uh, I've lived in both countries, and to hear them speak about each other is um, hair-raising sometimes, including currently. Uh, that's a separate issue than whether they can come up with a strategic alignment. I think that was Putin's hope when the West began sanctioning um, particularly in the area of oil and gas, that some of the advanced technologies, et cetera, and opportunities that they couldn't get from us, that they would get from China. And I think, you know, you remember in his, was it the um, 2016 Valdai speech, he talked about innovation and relations with China. By 2017, he wasn't talking about that anymore because the, Rus the Chinese were obviously in a much stronger position to drive a much harder bargain and it wasn't quite as advantageous as Russia hoped it would be. Um, similarly, their interests are different, I think, in, in, in many different ways um, and many different parts of the world. Uh, we'll see how things go on, on North Korea. There seems to be a little bit of an alignment there. But I think, ultimately, um, there has never been a lot of trust there. And for Russia, I think it's, it's still a matter of being respected by countries to its west more than to its east. Thank you so much. Khatuna Burkadze from Georgia. Thank you for a very interesting. Got the whole Georgian diaspora of, of, of Massachusetts. <laughs> I'd play tonight. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We got to get good shishlik somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Had you poor. You mentioned that uh, the Russian Federation is unpredictable, and I absolutely agree. I am witness every no, single. I said we were unpredictable now. That's I think, didn't I? Yes, you yeah. did. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, I mean, um, we think that Russian Federation is unpredictable mm -hmm. because every single day uh, Russia violates uh, the fundamental principle of international law. Um, and uh, we are interested. What do you think? What uh, Putin cares about most, really? And what kind of uh, strategic view we need uh, in terms of resolving this problem? Uh, I think that Putin believes, he believes in a strong, respected Russia that helps govern the planet. How he defines that is very far from um, what we would consider responsible stakeholdership, as you know. So I don't want to look behind his uh, steely blue eyes much more than, than that. i would let him speak for himself. Hi, uh, my name is Helen. I also came all the way across town. I'm an undergrad at Harvard. Uh, and first off, I just want to echo... My condolences. <laughs> now, now. <laughs> first off, I just want to echo what you said about the importance of student exchange programs. And I can say this as a, as a recipient of a Newsly uh, State Department scholarship to study abroad for a year in Moldova. Um, and that's sort of the motivation for my question, which is, um, what do you think is the proper... U.S. role towards countries like Moldova, where you have a pro-European, nominally pro-European government that tends to be in reality more pro-corruption and pro-oligarchy, uh, that often asks for U.S. and European support uh, against the Russian geopolitical threat. Well, what we've tried to do in Moldova over you know many years, but particularly in this last chapter of. Uh, of uh, Moldovan relationship with us and with the European Union in particular, uh, is set very high standards for the support that we give. So if you want to have US and EU support for your reforms, you need to be cleaning up the judiciary, you need to be cleaning up the banking sector, and working very intensively with them. This was certainly the policy when I was in the European um, uh, office setting really clear benchmarks. You know, this is what we need to see if you want us to continue to support you in this semester, in the next semester, et cetera, and trying to hold those in, in power to it, and particularly supporting 
the Moldovan conversation with the IMF, because the IMF sets the gold standard, obviously, for uh, real reform, and they're hard to fool. Um, sometimes we were successful, sometimes we weren't. Um, Moldova is another one of those countries that needs a new generation of, of leadership because um, you know, a lot of the old guard are, are in it for the money. Thank you. Uh, Gabriel Obama, productive student for Tufts. So my question is, um, how much should Helen's razor be applied to Russia? Helen's razor is, do not, apply, do not apply to maliciousness, what could also be applied to incompetence, roughly. Um, an example, when the Salisbury nerve agent case first came out, uh, news outlets were saying that um, Russia screwed up and that was a that it made a mistake, that it was supposed to be an assassination, and that there was just collateral damage, and that the man didn't die. But now the news is saying, oh, that was meant to be, he was meant to live to send a message. Um, and there's another case of that happening specifically in application to Russia. People unsure whether the, Russia had made a mistake, or whether there was a, there, there, that was their intention and the miss and we are missing something. So, can you give any thoughts on that? Just to, I want to piggyback on that question because it raises a slightly different one, which is, I certainly take his point that sometimes, you know, actions and you know, confusing actions in foreign policy often you attribute you attribute to malevolence when in fact you should attribute to incompetence. Right, and the same is true of how Russia sees us. Sometimes right, exactly. We're just stupid, right? But I, so, but related to that, to what extent do you worry? that the, in the United States right now, essentially, we are exaggerating you know, the sort of Russia problem. This is not to deny that Russia obviously poses certain challenges, but there are ways in which you know, their actions in Syria, their actions in Ukraine, very often you, know, you read the same things I do, they're interpreted as being, oh my god, these master tactician strokes by Putin, when in fact he's bogged down in various places and, and you know, in fact these aren't necessarily the sort of, uh, he's not the strategic genius that some writers have made him out to be? Uh, I join those who think that Putin is playing a very weak hand extremely well, partly because we are off the field and confused about what we want and not unified either within ourselves or with our allies in terms of, of a response. That said, um, you know, with regard to the, the Salisbury incident, what the heck was post-Soviet nerve agent doing in Salisbury to begin with. Does it matter if they were trying to kill him or just scare him? It's unacceptable, uh, and it's dangerous. And if it can happen in Salisbury, it can happen in St. Louis, and it can happen in Siena, you know? So it, there has to be a firm response. Thank you. And I think we have our last question. Wow, I survived the tough gauntlet, maybe. <laughs> we'll see what I would say you, you, my you, friends in Moscow do with this yeah. conversation. Yeah. Ambassador Yola, hi, Professor Dresner. My name is Dennis Bedavanets. I'm a student here at Tufts undergrad in my final year from Prague, Czech Republic. And I wanted to keep my um, question short. Um, to what extent do you worry that the sort of Nord Stream 2 project threatens unity within Europe um, and even sort of the common position, generally common position that the US and let's say the, its, its European partners have had towards Russia? Uh, well, as you know, we worked very hard over the last four or five years in particular to try to help European countries diversify their energy supplies, not to say to them, don't have some of your energy mix come from Russia, but just don't become dependent. And the problem with Nord Stream is it just increases dependence at a time when there are so many other options, including reverse flow, LNG, et cetera. Um, and it seems to be, um, you know, one of the more successful efforts by the Kremlin to get in financial bed with certain stakeholders in Western Europe who are thinking about themselves rather than the geostrategic um, uh, future of their part of the world. So I think what's important is to expose the dangers. And interestingly, lots of countries in the region are starting to ask the right kinds of questions. You know, Denmark asking about, um, you know, whether there are strategic implications. You have a pipeline under the Baltic Sea. The next thing you know, you need frigates to protect it. And what does that mean in terms of access 
denial, some of the other countries starting to ask the environmental question, why are we digging a big old hole in our beautiful Baltic Sea if we don't need to, if there are other options. So I think it's actually a great democratic experiment and it's a pretty good thing that these questions are being raised. Yeah. Um, so with that, I very much uh, want to thank you, Victoria. Um, you know, as you are fully aware, the State Department has experienced something of an exodus of, of yes. trained personnel uh, over the last uh, 14 months, um, which does not serve American interests well. And I've argued uh, to my students repeatedly that now is the time to buy low and go back, you know, go into the State Absolutely. Department. Absolutely. Um, because yeah, that is actually a way in which you can earn, you know, always lean against the wind in this sense. Um, that you know you can earn uh, uh, seniority by going in now, but let me also make it clear that I really am hoping there is a time in which you are no longer the CEO of CNS, but rather actually helping to guide Russia policy because I think both countries would be better off if that was well, the case. You're, you're kind, but uh, I want to encourage all of you to look at what we're doing at CNAS and also to look at our internship program, which is one of the best in Washington. So get online and check us out. And please do take the Foreign Service exam. I agree with Dan 400%. Buy low now. We need the best brains in American diplomacy uh, to rebuild uh, what we've uh, lost in the last year. So please join me in thanking very much Victoria Nulu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tufts. <laughs>